Hey guys, this is Vyom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I will be talking about one of the stocks that I came across while going through Josh Tarasov's portfolio. I was watching Monish Pabrai's lectures recently and found out that Josh Tarasov was one of the portfolio managers whose holdings Monish Pabrai watches. One of the holdings that Josh Tarasov had was Brookfield Asset Management, which is going to be the topic of this video. In this video, we'll go through the company's annual report to get a better understanding of the company's business then review the company's fundamentals and finally find the intrinsic value of this company. So let's dive in and review Brookfield Asset Management. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the Form 40F, which is the annual report that Brookfield Asset Management filed with the SEC. On page 29 of this report, the company provides us information about its business. It states that it is a leading global alternative asset manager and has about $600 billion of assets under management across a broad portfolio of real estate, infrastructure, renewable power, private equity, and credit. The company claims that it invests in a disciplined manner, targeting returns of 12 to 15 percent over the long term with strong downside protection. Next, Brookfield Asset Management talks about its investment focus. The company states that it predominantly invests in real assets across real estate, infrastructure, renewable power, and private equity, and holding a significant investment in Oak Tree Capital Management, which is leading global alternative investment management firm with an expertise in credit. And just an aside, Howard Marks, who is a famous value investor, is a co-chairman of Oak Tree Capital Management. After that, Brookfield talks about its diverse product offerings, which includes public and private vehicles to invest across a number of product lines, including core, value-added, and opportunistic growth equity and credit strategies in both closed ends and perpetual vehicles. The focused investment strategies is where the company shows off its competitive advantage, such as its strong capabilities as owner-operator, its large-scale capital, and its global reach. Next, the company talks about its disciplined financing approach, where it employs leverage in a prudent manner to enhance the returns while preserving capital throughout business cycles. The company also points out that only 6% of its total leverage reported in its consolidated financial statements has recourse to the corporation. What this means is only 6% of the company's liabilities are such that they're collateralized. In other words, in case the company were to default, only 6% of its liabilities are such that the lenders would have claim on its assets. Finally, the company talks about sustainability, where it states that it is committed to ensuring that the assets and business in which it invests are set up for long-term success, and it seeks to have a positive impact on the environment and communities in which it operates. Next, the company talks about its large-scale capital, where it outlines that it has approximately $600 billion in assets under management and $312 billion in fee-bearing capital. The company has about 150,000 operating employees and has focus on maximizing value and cash flow from its assets and business. Finally, the company has global reach as it operates in more than 30 countries on five continents around the world. Next, the company talks about its seven operating segments. The first one is asset management. The asset management operation include managing its long-term private funds, perpetual strategies, and public securities on behalf of its investors and themselves, as well as a share of asset management activities of Oak Tree. The company generates contractual-based management fees for its activities as well as incentive distributions and performance income including performance fees, transaction fees, and carried interest. Next, the real estate operations include the ownership, operation, and development of core office, core retail, limited partner investments, and other properties. The renewable power operations include the ownership, operation, and development of hydroelectric, wind, solar, and energy transition power generating facilities. The company's infrastructure operations include the ownership, operation, and development of utilities, transportation, midstream, data, and sustainable resource assets. The private equity operations include a broad range of industries and are more focused on business services, infrastructure services, and industrials. Residential development operations consist of home building, condominium development, and land development. Finally, the corporate activities include the investment of cash and financial assets, as well as the management of its corporate leverage, including corporate borrowings and preferred equity, which fund a portion of capital invested in its other operations. After that, the company goes into further detail about all these operating segments. I'll be focused on the publicly traded subsidiaries that the company listed. The first one is that the company owns and operates real estate assets primarily through about 57% fully diluted economic ownership in Brookfield Property Partners. The next one is the renewable power where the company states that it owns and operates renewable power assets primarily through a 51% ownership in Brookfield Renewable Partners LP. Next, the company talks about its infrastructure, where it states that it owns and operates infrastructure assets primarily through about 28% economic ownership in Brookfield Infrastructure Partners. 
Finally, the company talks about its private equity and others, where it states that it owns and operates private equity assets primarily through about 64% interest in Brookfield Business Partners LP. Now that we went through four of the company's publicly traded subsidiaries, let's look at the company's revenue breakdown, which is on page 115. For the year 2020, the company's total segment revenue was about $67 billion. The funds from operations gives us an idea of the income brought in through business activities. For the year 2020, the company's funds from operations was about $5 billion. And the company's total equity for the year 2020 was about $31.7 billion. If you think about the bigger picture, Brookfield Asset Management's current market cap is about $85 billion. And if you just focus on the funds from operations, so let's not worry about the hard assets and the economic interests that the company has in its subsidiaries. If you just focus on the funds from operations, the company brings in about $5 billion in cash every year. What this means is if you were to purchase all the shares outstanding that the company has, it would take us about 17 years to break even on this investment. That is just focusing on the cash coming into the business. If you include the hard assets and the equity that the company has in its subsidiaries, we would be breaking even a lot sooner if you make this purchase. Now that we have a brief understanding of Brookfield Asset Management's business and its operating segments, let's review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. Hey guys, now let's look at the key ratios. I'm on Morningstar, look at Brookfield Asset Management under key ratios. We have the financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. Back in 2011, the company's revenue was about $16 billion. And for the trading 12 months, that number had grown to about $71 billion. Over the past 10 years, the company's revenue has been trending upwards. Next, looking at the operating income. The operating income is the amount of money that's left with the company once we subtract the cost of goods and operating expenses from the company's revenue. Back in 2011, the company's operating income was about $2.6 billion. And for the trading 12 months, that number had grown to about $11 billion. Similar to the company's revenue, the company's operating income has been trending upwards. After that, looking at the net income, the net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it pays for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on instead obligations, and taxes. Back in 2011, the company's net income was about $2 billion. And for the trading 12 months, that number was about $3.5 billion. Apart from the unique year in 2020, the company over the past 10 years has always had a positive net income number, which means that the company has always reported a profit. Ideally, we want to see the company's revenue, operating income, and net income numbers to be positive and trending upwards. After that, looking at the dividends per share, back in 2011, the company paid out about $0.23 cent per share as dividend, and for the trading 12 months, that number had grown to about $0.51 cent per share. The company has hiked its dividends every year for the past 10 years. Next is the shares outstanding. Back in 2011, the company had 1,496 million shares outstanding. And for the trading 12 months, that number had grown to about 1,557 million shares outstanding. When we look at the past 10 year trend, we can see that the company from the year 2011 through 2014 bought back its shares. Then it issued more shares all the way through 2017. Then it bought back its shares in 2018. Then it issued more shares after 2018 till today. When a company issues more shares, it dilutes the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. However, share issuance is a way for the company to raise capital in order to finance its growth. So ideally, we want to see the company's shares outstanding number to be staying steady or decreasing. Next, we have the book value per share. The book value is what we get when we subtract the company's total liabilities from its total assets. Back in 2012, the company's book value was about $13 per share. And for the trading 12 months, that number had grown to about $25 per share. Over the past 10 years, the company's book value per share has always been positive, which tells us that the company always had more assets and liabilities on its balance sheet. And the company's book value per share has also been trending upwards, which tells us that the proportion of the company's assets to its liabilities is increasing. Finally, looking at the free cash flow, the free cash flow is what we get when we subtract the company's capital spending from its operating cash flow. Back in 2011 and 2012, the company's free cash flow was negative, primarily because the company's capital spending exceeded its operating cash flow. In 2013, the company's free cash flow was $712 million, and for the year 2020, it was $4,329 million. Ever since 2013, the company's free cash flow has been positive and trending upwards. I will be using the 2020 free cash flow number of $4,329 million for my discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Now let's look at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's bottom line to its top line, so it compares the company's net income to its revenue. Back in 2011, the company's net margin was about 11.63%, and for the trading 12 months, that number was about 4.69%. What this means is every $100 that the company made in sales, 
After paying the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on his debt obligations, and taxes, the company had $4.69 left as pure profit. Next is the return on equity. The return on equity is the ratio of the company's net income to its shareholders' equity. Warren Buffett prefers to only invest in securities that have had a return on equity of 8% or greater every year for the past 10 years. Back in 2011, the company's return on equity was about 12.53%, and for the trained 12 months, it was 9.83%. Over the past 10 years, there were six years when the company's return on equity was greater than 8%. Next is the return on invested capital. This number gives us an idea of how good the management is at allocating the company's capital and getting a return on that investment. Back in 2011, the company's return on invested capital was 8.47%, and for the trained 12 months, that number was 4.7%. The company's weighted average cost of capital, also known as the company's hurdle rate, is about 5.7%. And since the company's return on invested capital is less than its weighted average cost of capital, we can see that the company's management is not creating value for its shareholders. In other words, the company's return on invested capital is subpar. Finally, looking at the interest coverage, the interest coverage gives us an idea of how many times can the company pay off its interest obligations using its income in that calendar year. Back in 2011, the company's return on invested capital was about 2.74 times. And for the trained 12 months, that number was about 2.72 times. Over the past 10 years, the company's interest coverage has stayed fairly consistent. Now let's look at the financial health and liquidity ratios. The first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want the company's current ratio to be greater than 1.0, as that tells us that the company has enough current assets to fulfill its current liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's current ratio was at 2.16. And for the latest quarter, it's at 0.80. Next is the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the current ratio except we disregard the inventory component. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. Ideally, we want the company's quick ratio to be greater than 1.0 as that tells us that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's quick ratio was at 1.5 and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.61. Both the current and quick ratios indicate that the company is not as liquid as we would like. So the company may have to sell off some of its non-current assets in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Next is the financial leverage. The financial leverage is the ratio of the company's total assets to its shareholders' equity. So financial leverage of 1.0 tells us that all of the company's assets are financed via its shareholders' equity. A high financial leverage tells us that more of the company's assets are financed via liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's financial leverage was at 5.43. And for the latest quarter, it's at 9.42. Over the past 10 years, the company's financial leverage has been trending upwards, and that is not a trend that we want to see, as when a company becomes more financially leveraged, it is more prone to failure during an economic downturn. At the same time, we saw in the company's financial statements that only 6% of its liabilities are recoursed. In other words, only 6% of its liabilities are collateralized. Said differently, if the company were to default, only 6% of those liabilities are tied to assets on its balance sheet. So even though the company's financial leverage is high, the risk of complete loss may not be that high. Finally, looking at the debt to equity ratio, back in 2011, the company's debt to equity ratio was at 1.7, and for the latest quarter, it's at 3.65. Similar to the company's financial leverage, the company's debt to equity ratio has also been trending upwards. Finally, looking at the efficiency ratios, the first item on the list is the day sales outstanding. This number gives us an idea of how many days go by from the day the company recognizes its sale to the date it actually receives cash for that service rendered. Back in 2011, the company's day sales outstanding was about 138 days, and for the trained 12 months, that number was about 74 days. Ideally, we want the company's day sales outstanding number to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose day sales outstanding number is growing rapidly, as that tells us that the company's management may be aggressive with its accounting as it's trying to recognize its revenue sooner so that it can inflate its income numbers on its income statement. However, in the case of Brookfield Asset Management, it appears that the management is not playing any such accounting tricks. Next is the day's inventory. Brookfield Asset Management has little to no inventory. So using this number in our analysis would make little to no sense. However, ideally we want to see the company's day's inventory number to be staying steady or decreasing. And that is what we are seeing in the case of the company's day's inventory numbers. Finally, looking at the payables period, this number gives an idea of how many days does the company take to pay its suppliers. Back in 2011, the company took about 242 days to pay its suppliers. And for the trained 12 months, that number was about 179 days to pay its suppliers. Ideally, we want the company's payable spirit to be staying steady or decreasing. Now let's look at Brookfield Asset Management's current valuation. The company's price to earnings ratio is at 25.54. The company's price to sales is at 1.19 times. The company's price to book is at 2.2 times. The company's enterprise value to revenue. And enterprise value is market cap plus debt minus cash. 
So it's enterprise value to revenue is about 3.34 times. And finally, the company's enterprise value to its earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization is about nine times. We can think about enterprise value as how much money would it take to buy the whole company. So the enterprise value to revenue tells us that it would take about 3.34 times the company's revenue to buy the whole company. And it would take about nine times the company's earnings before its interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization to buy the whole company. Now let's look at the company's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis to find its intrinsic value. Over here, I pasted the company's 2020 free cash flow number that I got from Morningstar, which was $4,329 million. I'm assuming an annual growth rate of free cash flow to be 6%. What this means is I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 6% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%. What this means is I want this investment to give me a 10% return every year. Said differently, I want to double my investment in about seven years. Next, I'm assuming a long-term growth rate to be 2.125%. What this means is I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 2.125% every year after the 10-year mark into perpetuity. This 2.125% is in line with the 30-year treasury yield. The company has 1,557 million shares outstanding and has a recourse obligation of about $5,450 million. After taking all of these inputs into account, we get the company's intrinsic value to be about $43.30 per share. And when we compare this intrinsic value to the company's current stock price, which is about $54.65 per share, we can see that the company's current stock price is trading about 1.26 times the company's intrinsic value. The way we calculate this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows, which come out to about $36 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10-year mark in perpetuity. We sum all those up to get the intrinsic value to be about $73 billion. From this number, we subtract the company's recourse obligation and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value per share to be about $43.30. Now, if we disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if you think that the company is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist, then we get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be about $19.3 per share. If we disregard the company's recourse obligation, then we get the intrinsic value without the recourse obligation to be about $46.80 per share. Finally, let's try to figure out what kind of return can we expect to get on this investment if we were to buy the security at the current stock price. And to do so, we'll run a what-if analysis, do a goal seek. We'll set the sell as our intrinsic value to our current stock price, which is $54.65 per share. And we'll run this analysis by changing the company's discount rate. What we get after running the analysis is that if you were to buy the security at the current stock price, we can expect to get an annual return of about 8.58%. So overall, we saw that Brookfield Asset Management is highly diversified. Its exposure ranges from real estate, infrastructure, renewable energy, private equity, and asset management. The company has good fundamentals, is trading about two times its book value, and could provide about 8.6% annual return on this investment. It is important to note that the company has a lot of liabilities. However, only 6% of the company's total liabilities are recourseable obligations. In other words, only 6% of the liabilities are such that those lenders would have claims on the company's assets. Additionally, the company's fee-bearing capital as of September 2021 was about $325 billion dollars and the company generates a lot of its recurring fees on its capital. If there was an economic downturn in the future and a run on the bank, then there would be a drawdown on this capital, which would mean the company would not be able to generate as much revenue under its asset management section. Lastly, according to Data Roma, there are many value investors who have this stock in their portfolio. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on Brookfield Asset Management interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on which stock I should view next, please leave it in the comment section below. I'll greatly appreciate it. Thank you.